WCW Spring Stampede 1997 took place on April 6th in Tupelo, Mississippi. Like the inaugural 1994 Spring Stampede event, the show has a western theme with the 1997 edition heavily featuring the four horsemen in the event's promotional material. As a quick side note, there was no Spring Stampede in 1995 or 1996. There is also no Hollywood Hogan on this show, meaning there is no WCW Championship match. Instead, the show is main evented by a Diamond Dallas Page vs Randy Savage grudge match. There has also been a little confusion regarding the WCW Tag Team title match. Scott Hall hasn't been on WCW TV and he's booked in a title defence tonight along with Kevin Nash against Rick Steiner and Scott Steiner. Kevin Nash got angry on Nitro due to NWO members choosing a Dennis Rodman movie premiere over appearing on the show to fight WCW. Scott Hall got a bye ball from Big Sexy as Kevin explained that his tag partner was dealing with things more important than pro wrestling. In reality, Scott had checked himself into rehab, and WCW didn't come up with any kind of explanation other than he was missing in action. Scott Hall is not at Spring Stampede, and it's announced at the beginning of the show that Kevin will face both Steiners in a 2 on 1 match, and the tag titles will be on the line. The semi main tonight is a 4 corners match, The Giant vs Lex Luger vs Booker T vs Stevie Ray, and the winner of the match will get a shot at Hollywood Hogan's World Championship. Our opening match features Ultimo Dragon taking on Rey Mysterio Jr. So Mr WCW pay per view Dean Malenko is not opening the card this time around, the Malenko vs Benoit match is a little later on. The match begins with your standard holds and locks and Dragon ends up hitting a body slam. The two go at it again and Mysterio applies a leg trap camel clutch, Dragon performs a wrist lock and Mysterio gets out with a headstand counter. The wrestlers show respect to each other afterwards and the crowd gives a round of applause. Dragon puts Ray down with his kick combo and he follows this up with a drop kick. The match goes to the mat again with Dragon in control, keeping the focus on Mysterio's left arm. The fans then get excited for Dragon's spinning backbreaker drop and Dragon follows up with a powerbomb catapult combination that looked excellent. Ultimo Dragon brings it back to basics momentarily with a sleeper hold but then he pulls off a running lagger bomb that I must have watched back 5 or 6 times. Spring Stampede had a wonderful start here and this was commonplace at WCW pay per views, the opening match was always exciting. Mysterio then gets rocked with a tombstone pile driver and Dragon could have ended the match right here, but he breaks his own pin, Bobby Heenan says this was a mistake. Another sleeper gets applied but Ray breaks out and we see a spinning wheel kick, Dragon replies with a clothesline before applying a muda lock and a surfboard. Ray just hasn't been able to get going here at all. The match goes to the outside where Ray throws his opponent into the guardrail, Ray then rushes into the ring to try and regroup a little but Dragon catches Mysterio with another sleeper. The crowd pops when Ray gets up and he applies a sleeper of his own before knocking Dragon out of the ring, and Ray then performs a springboard senton before we go to split screen. Let's just appreciate this layout and the random picture of the western bar taking up a third of the screen. What's going on here? Stagger Lee wants to get a word with Kevin Nash, apparently Big Sexy has a demand in regards to his 2 on 1 match later on, but it's Six who pops his head out of the door. We can't hear what he says but the door gets slammed in Lee's face. Back in the ring, Dragon misses a middle rope crossbody, Ray tries to take advantage but he ends up getting drop kicked out of the ring. Dragon performs a plancha before the match gets back inside the ropes where Mysterio gets drop kicked out of a lion salt. Dragon then pulls off a giant swing that makes both men a little dizzy, but Ray comes back with a cartwheel spinning Hurricane Rana. Both guys then try to pin but neither competitor can get a 3 count. Dragon goes back in control with an enziguri, we then see the Dragon Steiner, but Ray keeps himself in the match by getting a foot on the ropes. The match comes to an end with Ray avoiding a tiger suplex, he then ducks a wheel kick and Rey Mysterio wins the match with a springboard hurricane rana. A really good opening match here that had some excellent pacing. WCW continues its tradition of making opening matches must see attractions, a good start to spring stampede. 
Lee Marshall tries to get a word with Kevin Nash again. Six again shows up at the door, but this time Rick and Scott Steiner show up. Nash then appears as Scott and Rick get held back by Doug Dillinger and the boys, and Nash announces that he wants Nick Patrick as the referee tonight if he has to take on both Steiner brothers on pay-per-view. Nash then spits on Scott, Scott punches a random guy holding him back, and Doug Dillinger decides he can't handle it and Steiner gets maced. Scott screams for Rick to help him, but Rick is also getting held back. Scott ends up getting cuffed and he continues to scream for help. So we're going to have to wait to see how this affects the tag team title match a little later in the evening. The commentary team do absolutely nothing but talk about this throughout the next couple of matches by the way. Watch the TV title match a little later on and you'll notice that the action in the ring is totally ignored in favour of the Nash vs Steiner storyline. The Medusa vs Akira Hokuto match was up next and it wasn't bad at all, it's one of Medusa's better matches in recent times. It's around 5 minutes long, pretty standard for WCW women's matches, and it starts off with Akira in control but Medusa turning it around with a few punches in the corner that gets a great pop from the audience. After a bit of back and forth, Medusa finds herself at the ropes and Sonny Ono decides to slap Medusa around a little. Medusa kicks Ono away but this doesn't stop Sonny from going back at Medusa while we get to see the world's most oblivious referee. They fucked up the ending though, Medusa hits her German suplex, Sonny Ono jumps on the apron to stop the count, but the referee paid no attention to Akira's manager and Akira wasn't sure if she should kick out or not. Have a look yourself. You can also hear the bell ringing but the match isn't over. Medusa kicks Ono off the apron and she goes to finish Akira off, but Luna Vachon shows up and she costs Medusa the match. I was beginning to worry that we wouldn't see Luna again after her debut on Nitro a few weeks ago, so it's good to see she's still here, but it's not so good for Medusa. Akira Hokuto retains the women's championship at Spring Stampede. Lord Steven Regal vs Prince Iakea was up next for the TV title. We have established on Reliving the War that the Prince really wasn't ready to get heavily showcased on TV. His recent pay per view matches with Rey Mysterio weren't great and his most recent Nitro match against Leparka was bad too. But this match here with Lord Steven Regal was actually pretty solid and that's because Regal forced the Prince to work at Regal's pace. Prince Iakea wasn't given many opportunities to screw things up thanks to Regal keeping things grounded with a more straight laced style of wrestling and it done wonders for Iakea. Tony Schiavone announced at the start of the match that Scott Steiner has been arrested and this means Nash only has to face Rick Steiner tonight but the tag titles are still on the line. As mentioned earlier, this is all the commentary team talk about throughout this match. We get our standard wrist locks and headlocks at the beginning of the bout but if you plan on watching this back, pay attention to how much Regal gets out of these standard holds. Ikea manages to bring it to the mat with a headlock takedown, Regal gets to his feet, he gets in a cheap shot when Ikea releases the headlock and Regal brings his leg down over Ikea's head, remembering to play up to the crowd afterwards and again getting the most out of the simplest things. Ikea gets thrown out of the ring and he comes back in with a springboard crossbody. Regal loses a test of strength but he bridges out and Regal decides to poke Ikea in the eye afterwards. He says it was an open palm strike and the referee buys it. His lordship almost caves in Prince Iakea's back with a hard forearm shot and he tries to end it with a full Nelson submission but Prince stays in the match. The TV champion tries to steal a victory with a sunset flip but Regal punches him in the face and the match continues. Big European uppercuts from Regal get answered with a few chops from the Prince. Regal is forced into the corner where he begs for mercy and the Prince backs off. This was a mistake. Regal obviously doesn't give Ikea the same courtesy when the referee calls for a break in the opposite corner. And check out this spot here, this sums up the match so well in almost a meta sense. The Prince tries a crossbody and Regal just walks away from it, resulting in Prince's high risk offense not paying off and showing that wrestling smart and keeping things straightforward would probably be a better strategy for the TV champion. And guess what, keeping it simple leads to Prince Iakea winning the match, a back body drop gets followed up with a few chops, Regal goes for a schoolboy pin but the Prince twists out of it and he pins Regal for the 3 count. I think if you watch this match without watching Nitro and without understanding where Prince Iakea was, 
you'd probably write it off as a pretty average encounter, and indeed, it was pretty average on the grand scheme of things, but those who saw how bad IKEA was in previous matches would see what the plan was during this encounter at Spring Stampede. Regal got a better match out of Prince Ayake here, and he done that by leading a more deliberate style of match, with a focus on the fundamentals. Again, it wasn't a great match, but for Prince Ayake, it was his best TV title match to date. Just like on Monday Nitro when Chris Jericho defeated Regal, his lordship goes on the attack after the bell. Only this time, no one comes out to help Prince Ayake. Ric Flair comes out to cut a promo, and this time Flair has a few announcements. First of all, the Nature Boy is stepping back into the ring. On May 18th at WCW Slamboree, Ric Flair will have his first match since September of 1996. Flair then says that Kevin Green is coming back to WCW, and Green has agreed to team up with the Nature Boy. Bit odd seeing as Steve McMichael had some issues with Green last time around, but nonetheless, Flair calls out Hulk Hogan next and he challenges Hogan and other members of the NWO to step into the ring at Slamboree. Flair doesn't make it exactly clear what kind of challenge this is, not sure if it's a tag match or a 3 on 3 or 4 on 4 match that also includes the 4 horsemen, but Flair is back and he's wrestling on next month's pay per view. Speaking of the horsemen, Double J and Steve Mongo McMichael took on the public enemy next, and the story was the exact same as always. I think this was probably what the third or fourth time when it looked like Double J and Mongo had sorted out their differences. Even Big Steve done the Fargo strut, showing he and Jeff had maybe set aside their problems for the betterment of the horsemen. Johnny Grunge tried to put Deborah through a table and Double J had to come to her rescue. Grunge ended up putting himself through the table as Mongo and Rock battled on the entranceway. All was looking good until Deborah left the magical briefcase on the ring apron and Rocco Rock took it for himself. Double J applies a figure 4, he then gets whacked with the Halliburton, and the horsemen take another loss. I'm sure we'll hear all about it again tomorrow night on WCW Nitro, but this is just the same thing we see time and time again with Double J and Mongo McMichael. A common complaint with modern wrestling is that storylines are too short, and longer angles of the past were much better. That may be the case, but there were also some absolutely horrible storylines that lasted way longer than what they should have back in the 90s too. The problems with the horsemen during late 96 and 97 is a prime example. Mean Gene interviews Harlem Heat next, and you'll notice they're wearing different colours tonight, and that's because they aren't teaming up at Spring Stampede. They're in a four corners match, with the winner getting a world title shot. Now, we all know what happens here, Booker says something he shouldn't have. If you watch this on the network after the Peacock purchase, you get to hear the Turner home video edit, which, by the way, was pretty well done. Look the gold, sucker! Hulk Hogan, we coming for you, sucker! I should point out for the, the network version before the Peacock purchase has the unedited audio, and I can't play it here. The video will get flagged, I'm sure, but you know what happens. Booker T has stated quite a few times that this was one of the lowest points of his career, but well, what's done is done, you know, what can you do? Booker's reaction to his slip up though is priceless, and so is Sister Sherry's. She tried to comfort Booker and tell him it's okay, but Booker is clearly distraught. It's a legendary botch for sure, but you do feel bad for Booker a little and I'm sure it played on his mind throughout the remainder of the show. The thing is, verbal slip up aside, the promo was actually pretty good. Sherry started it off by saying Harlem Heat will divide and conquer tonight, echoing her statement on Monday Nitro. Booker T said this was all about Harlem Heat finally getting a chance to get the world title. And Stevie Ray says the Giant and Lex Luger are in the way of Harlem Heat getting a shot at Hulk Hogan's belt. Booker T then says that too many people have been looking over the heat, but the critics will be silenced tonight. What's interesting though is the fact that neither Booker nor Stevie talked about the possibility of wrestling each other in this Four Corners match. But yeah, everyone remembers the botch and the immediate reactions of Booker and Sherry afterwards. Stevie Ray's reaction? Well, apparently Stevie didn't pay attention and he didn't hear the slip up. He was too busy thinking about what he was going to say when it was his turn to talk. Chris Benoit gets a shot at Dean Malenko's US Championship next. Both Chris and Dean said they respect each other on Nitro, and Malenko wanted to give Chris a chance to win a singles championship. 
Both guys though have other feuds going on. Benoit and Kevin Sullivan have a rivalry that's been lasting forever, while Dean Malenko has been feuding with Eddie Guerrero, a guy who Dean has been trying to expose for what he truly is, a jealous cheater, according to Dean. Now, in comparison to Dean's other pay per view matches in 1997 and the ones we've just saw, this one plays out very differently and it shows how versatile the Iceman truly was. It starts off with your standard holds and locks but eventually it breaks down into both men trying to wear each other down. There's no quick pin attempts nor highly innovative holds or counters. It's all about who can go the longest and who can stay on their opponent and not stop. Almost a battle to see who has the better stamina. It's a great match too. Malenko works over the knee and leg early in the bout but Benoit fires back with a stiff shoulder block that almost floors Chris too. Dean comes back with a wrist lock but Benoit counters with a top wrist lock where he can apply much of his upper body weight onto Malenko. Malenko gets out with a body slam and he sells the wrist and arm afterwards. Benoit bridges during a test of strength and Malenko tries to bring Chris down by jumping on the crippler but Chris stays put. Benoit then gets to his feet, another wrist lock gets applied and Malenko gets stretched out on the mat. A slew of ground submissions by Chris Benoit follows where the neck and back is targeted. Malenko eventually stops the onslaught with a back suplex. Chris makes Dean pay with a few hard chops and I hope this comes across on YouTube because you can see the sweat getting knocked off Dean's chest. These are some hard shots. Dean isn't one to stand around and take punishment though. He lays the boots into the crippler and we can see that Chris has cut his hand open too. Dean then brings it back to the mat with an STF followed by a camel clutch. Chris then gets launched into the ropes and Dean applies a short arm scissors from an arm drag takedown. Chris gets out by lifting the Iceman up in the air while the hold is still applied and Dean gets slammed to the mat. We see another back suplex from Chris Benoit and he thinks this is enough to end the match but Dean kicks out of the pin attempt. An abdominal stretch gets applied next and it stays in for an extended period of time. Dean fights out eventually but a kick to the head from Chris Benoit puts Dean back on the canvas. Chris tries choking Malenko with the ropes and he lands a neck breaker. Again he thinks this is enough to end the bout but Malenko gets a foot on the ropes. Dean has taken quite a beating here but he's still going strong. Chris remains relentless. The sound of his knife edge chops echo throughout the arena but Malenko fires back with a running clothesline in the opposite corner. Dean goes for a suplex next but Chris counters with an inverted suplex that gets a great reaction from the crowd. This is when the match ends unfortunately and it's due to interference. First of all Jacqueline comes down and she begins fighting with woman. Jimmy Hart then tries to steal the US title and this leads to an injured Eddie Guerrero coming out. Eddie tries to get the belt back and in the middle of the chaos Benoit gets suplexed from the ring to the outside. Arn Anderson then makes his way down to the ring and he takes out Dean Malenko and then Kevin Sullivan shows up. In a repeat of Monday Nitro, Double A allows Sullivan to pass him. This leads to Sullivan smacking Benoit with a kendo stick. Sullivan then gets taken out and he falls on Eddie Guerrero. And all this chaos leads to Randy Anderson throwing the match out. Jimmy Hart, Jackie and Kevin Sullivan then put the belt on Eddie's shoulder. He's brought back up the entranceway and he protests that he doesn't want the belt but the question here is, is this all a setup and is Eddie just tricking everyone while acting innocent? The finish lets this one down a little. This was an absolute war inside the ropes and 5 people running down to interfere didn't do the match any favours. We know Anderson wanted his rivalry with Sullivan to be water under the bridge but in a roundabout way. Anderson just cost Benoit the US title. Malenko talks to Chris afterwards saying he was not supposed to be here. And we don't know if Malenko was referring to Guerrero, Anderson or Sullivan but either way there's mutual respect shown between the two competitors. It's a shame the match ended the way it did but don't let it stop you from watching. This is still a highly recommended matchup. Kevin Nash comes out for his match against Rick Steiner and he's brought Nick Patrick, Ted DiBiase and Six along with him so you know exactly what's gonna happen in this one. Rick tries attacking Nash right at the opening bell but the big man overpowers his opponent. Rick takes a clothesline in the corner, Big Sexy lays in a few back elbows but Rick gets an opening at the opposite side of the ring. Nash takes a big boot followed by a Steiner line. A belly to belly suplex follows and there was just about enough rotation here to land the move clean. 
Nash is under the rope slightly and this means Rick has to break his follow up pin attempt. We see Rick's scoop power slam next and any of these power moves of Rick Steiner are gonna look impressive when Nash takes them. This is no exception. The NWO then come into play when Six holds down the top rope and Steiner tumbles to the outside. Patrick has a conversation with Nash as Six lays in the kicks on the outside. Nash throws Rick back into the ring and the dogface gremlin takes a sidewalk slam. Steiner then gets choked on the ropes and Ted DiBiase gets in a cheap shot. This is turning into another slaughter by the NWO as Kevin Nash floors Rick with a big boot. Nash signals for the end, he hits a jackknife, but Rick manages to kick out a two, surprisingly, and Rick really should have stayed down. Things get pretty bad for the Steiner brother next as Nash begins targeting Rick's injured ear. In storyline, Rick had a busted eardrum. Still, Rick manages to hit a low blow and he hits his bulldog from the middle rope, but Nash kicks out a two. The commentators say this was a slow count from Patrick by the way, but it absolutely wasn't. Nash then takes a few more clotheslines, but Six distracts Steiner long enough for Kevin to hit Rick with a clothesline of his own. Six then tries to remove the turnbuckle padding, he has a little trouble so Ted DiBiase lends a helping hand, and Kevin Nash then performs snake eyes on Rick, again targeting the side of the head and the injured ear. Nash does this twice and Ted DiBiase ends up showing sympathy for Rick and he tries to reason with Kevin that that's enough. Nash tells DiBiase that he's supposed to be NWO and Big Sexy will tell DiBiase when enough's enough. Kevin does it again and DiBiase decides he's going to leave the ringside area. This was all playing off the stuff on Nitro with certain NWO members not showing up. DiBiase wasn't on Nitro and so Kevin doesn't seem to care too much about what DiBiase has to say and he doesn't care about DiBiase leaving the arena. Steiner gets dropped one more time, we see another jackknife, Nick Patrick hesitates making the count but Nash forces the referee to do his job. Big Sexy picks up the win at Spring Stampede 1997, while not a match you'd call overly competitive, this one helped Kevin Nash stand out among a sea of NWO members and the NWO having problems is way more refreshing than the horsemen having problems. The issue here though is that this could easily turn out to be a repeat of the four horsemen stuff and that's something we just don't want to see. Still, Kevin came across like a real bully here, one of the more dominant members of the NWO and a guy who wasn't prepared to take shit from neither his friends or his enemies. Not a great match, but I'm liking this no-nonsense version of Kevin Nash. The Giant and Lex Luger get interviewed before the Four Corners match and the Giant says this was all Hulk Hogan's plan. He's trying to turn brother against brother and friend against friend. Giant says he and Luger are a team but Giant understands that whoever wins this thing, they deserve the title shot, no matter if it's Luger, Booker, Stevie or himself. Lex says WCW is here to claim what's theirs. This is a shot at Hollywood Hogan and a shot to bring the new world order down. Harlem Heat, The Giant and Luger are going to wrestle tonight, but the end goal is to bring the championship back to WCW and restore prestige to world championship wrestling. So in short, Team Giant Package here are happy enough to fight each other to get a chance at Hollywood Hogan. Harlem Heat make their entrance together as does Luger and The Giant. This one is every man for himself, you can tag out at any time and you can tag in whoever you want. The first man to score a pinfall or submission will win the match. Lex Luger and Booker T start this one off and you're just watching to see if Harlem Heat will square off against each other or if Luger and the Giant will fight each other and you know what's going to happen eventually but the competitors make us wait it out. Luger floors Booker with a clothesline and a press slam follows. Booker fights back a little but when Luger hits another clothesline, Booker decides to tag out and we see Harlem Heat working together. This gets followed up with Luger and the Giant working as a team in the opposite corner also. And then the Giant gets officially tagged in and we have the big man versus Stevie Ray for a little. Stevie shows no fear by going straight after the Giant but fuck me, Stevie takes another clothesline and another one afterwards. There's a lot of clotheslines in this match. Booker gets in the ring to try and help Stevie but he takes a press slam for his trouble and then Booker and Stevie argue on the outside a little, setting up their inevitable fight a little later in the match. Before we get there though, Stevie Ray tags in the giant, meaning giant package is gonna explode tonight at Spring Stampede. 
Their fight doesn't last long, they lock up, Luger tries to body slam his partner but the giant falls on top of Lex, Luger kicks out and then Stevie Ray and Booker T get tagged in. This I feel is way more interesting than the giant and Luger having to fight, and Harlem Heat take their time in building up a little anticipation. The two are evenly matched as they go through a wrist lock and headlock routine. A drop down leapfrog sequence then ends with the brothers showing each other a little respect. And the crowd boos as it looks like Booker and Stevie aren't gonna fight each other here. Booker tags in Lex Luger and what a shame this was. Neither team fight with each other for the remainder of the match and it pretty much turns into a normal tag team match after this. Not much point going into further detail, let's just skip to the end. Luger takes a beating for the rest of the bout and he needs to tag out. The giant gets tagged in and he and Stevie Ray end up the legal man. Giant has the match won, all he needs to do is put Stevie away with a choke slam, but he tags Luger back in, completely gifting the total package with an easy win. Luger applies the rack and Luger wins a title shot against Hulk Hogan. I found this one pretty disappointing, there wasn't enough physicality between teammates and I know the Luger vs Hogan match is much more appealing than another Giant vs Hogan match, but it didn't really make sense for the Giant to give up a title shot and a chance to get his hands on Hogan again. Still, Luger is one of the most over WCW superstars of this time period and fans can now look forward to Lex getting a shot at the gold. The DDP vs Randy Savage feud started the night after Super Brawl. Randy Savage, the newest member of the New World Order at the time, attacked Dallas from behind and when Dallas said he was coming after Randy, the macho man treated DDP like he was a nobody. Savage would say that Dallas wasn't a threat to him and so Randy just went on about his business. Page wouldn't stop though, he was determined to get revenge on Randy. At WCW Uncensored, Randy and Liz revealed to wrestling fans that Kimberly was Dallas's wife, and Kimberly had also done a photo shoot for an adult magazine. Dallas wasn't happy that Randy was taking personal shots, but things got way worse when Kimberly walked out, completely covered in spray paint. It was clear the NWO got to her. Randy attacked Paige again at Uncensored, and Kimberly was spray painted again when she tried to protect her husband. And the next night on Monday Nitro, Paige agreed to wrestle Dallas at Spring Stampede. This match was a big deal for DDP, it was his first major one on one singles main event on pay per view so the pressure was high. It's truly a make or break bout for the master of the diamond cutter. Not counting the messy uncensored multi man main event, this is also Savage's first main event since Halloween Havoc last year. DDP cut a promo before the match where he said a man has to stand up for what really matters and what matters to DDP is his wife. Kimberly then appears and she says she prefers Dallas to keep a positive attitude about everything but tonight the rage of DDP is what will win him the match. Before the bout begins, Savage says this isn't DDP's big day, it's his last day on the planet. The crowd chants DDP as Randy gets in the ring but he quickly leaves again when Paige comes at him. Randy then goes to walk back up the entranceway but this was all done to trick DDP into following him. Randy tries to take advantage but he gets smashed into the guardrail. When the match gets back in the ring, Dallas again has to stop Randy from running away. Dallas goes for his high angle atomic drop but he overshoots it. And well, it doesn't look too hot but still a decent enough recovery. Dallas tries to end it with a diamond cutter but Randy holds onto the ropes. DDP cracks his head on the mat and Savage snaps DDP's neck across the top rope resulting in Paige falling out of the ring. The two men end up fighting through the crowd and they make it all the way up to the arena doors. Randy throws Dallas out and he lifts up a trash can but it's the macho man who ends up getting hit on the head. Randy ends up taking two trash can shots and he gets choked with some cables before the competitors get back to the ringside area. Savage uses Kimberly as a shield and Liz tries to hit Paige from behind. This distracts Dallas long enough for Randy to get in a cheap shot. From here, Randy destroys Paige on the outside. We see his double axe handle from the top rope to the outside and Paige gets rammed into the ring steps. And when Randy and Dallas get back in the ring, the macho man tries to pick up a cheap victory but DDP still kicks out. 
Savage tells Michael Buffer to get off his seat and Randy takes the chair. Paige takes a shot across the back and Mark Curtis ends up taking the chair away from Savage. Undeterred, Randy goes back to the outside and he doesn't only take Dave Penzer's chair, but he also gives Dave a hard smack across the face. Oh, no. Oh, no. Savage also kicks Dave right in the head before getting back in the ring, but Dallas takes the chair and he manages to push it in Randy's face. Randy gets up before Paige and Dallas takes a beating in the corner. Paige momentarily turns it around and Savage takes a ton of right hands, but a macho man clothesline completely destroys Dallas and it looks like Randy has Paige's number tonight, maybe Dallas was in over his head. Randy toys around with Paige a little but he gets too confident. Paige hits a clothesline of his own but once again Randy gets up before Dallas. Paige takes a body slam, a kick to the midsection, another two body slams. Paige is struggling to get back into this match and Randy is now getting a little more vicious. The macho man goes to the outside and he grabs the ring bell. Savage goes to the top rope to end the match, but Kimberly takes the ring bell away from macho. Randy decides he's gonna hit a diving elbow instead, but Paige gets the feet up and Randy gets clocked. This could be DDP's last chance, he signals for the diamond cutter. Paige tries to end it but Savage counters into the backslide position and he then hits DDP with a low blow. Dallas kicks out of the follow up pin attempt and Savage just snaps. He slaps our favourite referee Mark Curtis across the face, he hits the referee with a pile driver, he takes Mark's belt and he begins whipping the poor guy. Savage has totally lost it. Mark gets tossed out of the ring, Savage then hits the diving elbow on DDP. But of course, there's no referee to end the match. Here comes Nick Patrick to put an end to this massacre. Patrick hugs the macho man, macho goes for another body slam, but Paige counters with a diamond cutter and the roof comes off the arena. The commentators wonder if Patrick will make the three count and he does. Diamond Dallas Page defeats Randy Savage to end the show. Kevin Nash immediately hits the ring and he grabs Patrick by the throat while checking on Savage. Eric Bischoff in the New World Order then walk down to the ring and Bischoff doesn't look too happy with Nick Patrick for making the three count. Kevin Nash hits a jackknife on Patrick and Randy Savage takes out DDP, leaving Kimberly all alone in the ring. Savage grabs DDP's wife and surprisingly, Eric Bischoff tries to stop the macho man. Savage ends up shoving Eric down to the mat, Eric gets up and he pushes the macho man and Randy knocks Eric down with a right hand before the NWO rush into the ring to break things up. This right here is how Spring Stampede ended. It was Randy Savage who famously said on this evening, I think I want to take the diamond cutter tonight when the match finish was being discussed backstage. Savage wanted to give Paige the win at Spring Stampede even though he didn't have to, nor did he need to. But in losing he helped elevate Dallas even further and it was a gesture that Dallas still remembers fondly to this day. I covered all this in more detail in my Savage vs Paige rivalry video, so if you want to learn more please check that video out. It was a great main event though and you'll get much more out of it if you follow DDP's journey up to Spring Stampede. It's a very meaningful bout in terms of creating an even bigger star out of Dallas and it's just a very fun and very solid matchup. But that was Spring Stampede 1997, a decent show in my opinion with the Malenko vs Benoit, Dragon vs Mysterio and Page vs Savage matches being the highlights. Hopefully you'll join me on Thursday for Reliving the War where we'll check out the Nitro after Spring Stampede. The New World Order are seemingly falling apart with Savage now getting annoyed just like Kevin Nash. There's a lot of questions coming out of Spring Stampede and hopefully we get some answers on Nitro. But thank you so much for watching this one guys, I do appreciate it and take care. Five.